Many, many thousands of people refused to put up with the brutal and predatory occupation of their home countries during World War II. They resist, they take up arms, they go on strike, more often than not at substantial personal risk. Others are leaders, representing governments in exile, bringing smaller groups of resistance together, financing major clandestine operations, and even creating entire underground armies. I'm Spartacus Olsen, and this is a World War II in real-time gallery of European resistance leaders in 1942. Resistance against enemy occupation comes in many forms. In some cases, dissatisfaction with foreign aggression or circumstantial hardship causes people to oppose an occupation force. Others simply help their fellow human beings and do whatever they can to battle injustice, like giving those in need access to food or shelter. And then there are resistance movements that in some cases already predate the invasion in the form of a political party or organization that follows an ideology incompatible with that of the occupier. We already talked a fair bit in this series, and even back at the Great War, about one of the most well-known resistance leaders of World War II. Joseph Bros, known as Tito, was born to Croat and Slovene parents and served in the Austro-Hungarian army in the Great War, during which he was captured by the Russians. In a Russian work camp during the 1917 revolution, he joins the communists. Post-war in Yugoslavia, he rises through the ranks of the Communist Party, but is imprisoned for political agitation from 1928 to 1934 before becoming party leader in 1939. The party is still outlawed in Yugoslavia at that time, giving Tito experience in leading an underground insurrectionist party. Within months after the Axis powers aggressively take power in the Balkans in the spring of 1941, Tito launches an all-out revolution against the occupiers. He frames the goal of his rebellion not so much as a socialist uprising, but as a popular one vowing to liberate all of Yugoslavia and to give the many ethnicities the power of self-determination. This attracts many different groups, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Montenegrins, and Slovenes. But Tito remains a dedicated communist, and it is after the German invasion of the USSR that he really gets going. He actually receives these orders from Moscow on July 1st, 1941. The hour has struck when communists are obliged to raise the people in open struggle against the occupiers. Do not lose a single minute organizing partisan detachments and igniting a partisan war in the enemy's rear. Set fire to war factories, warehouses, fuel dumps, oil, petrol, etc. Aerodromes, destroy and demolish railways, telegraphs, and telephone lines. Prohibit the transport of troops and munitions, war materials in general. Organize the peasantry to hide grain, drive livestock into the forests. It is absolutely essential to terrorize the enemy by all means so that he will feel himself inside a besieged fortress. As we've seen, that is precisely what Tito sets out to do. And a large part of the local population is, regardless of ideology, activated by the brutality of the German, Italian, and Hungarian occupation policies. Actually, one of Tito's strategies is to gain popular support by provoking Axis retaliation against the civilian population. Well, he manages to liberate or help liberate different parts of the country during the war, the Republic of Uchice in 1941, for example. But one could argue that this isn't really resistance. Rather, Tito is the leader of a military counterstate that engages in partisan warfare, army against army. Sometimes resistance movements are directed from overseas as well. A sizable Polish resistance, for instance, is established by a general, Władysław Sikorski, and the Polish government in exile already in November 1939, and simply named the Armed Resistance. By the time it is officially reformed as the Armia Krajowa, Polish for Home Army in February 1942, many smaller resistance movements have become part of that larger one. They often act independently from London under local leadership, but from June 1940 they are generally under Stefan Rowetzki. When he takes over the organized Polish resistance, he and Sikorski first plan for a general uprising once the Allies are about to defeat Germany. Until that day, Poles must lay low and avoid open combat with the Germans. Instead, Rowetzki focuses on propaganda, sabotage, and intelligence. 
He reports early on on things like the treatment of Jews to the Polish government in exile, including the Ponary massacre in Lithuania and living conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1942, he gives detailed accounts of executions, deportations, and extermination camps. However, Rovetsky also reports on the general apathy within the Polish community towards the fate of the Jews, as well as on anti-Semitism within his own organization. There are resistance leaders, of course, who are not running or planning future military operations. One man crucial to the French resistance is Jean Moulin. The Free French are officially led by Charles de Gaulle from London, but in practice, de Gaulle has very little knowledge of or control over actual operations in occupied France. Moulin changes that. He is a civil servant dismissed by the Vichy government who consider him a radical. He keeps a diary of his work with the resistance, both chronicling and studying it. He drafts a report and delivers his commentary on the French resistance to de Gaulle after escaping France with a false passport. He arrives in London in September 1941 and meets de Gaulle in October. He says, If no organization imposes upon the French resistance some sort of discipline, some order, some plan of action, if no organization provides them with arms, two things will happen. On the one hand, we shall witness isolated activities born to certain failure which will definitely go against the common goal because they will take place at the wrong moment in a disorganized and inefficacious manner and thereby discouraging the rest of the population. On the other hand, we shall be driving into the arms of the communists thousands of French men who are burning with the desire to serve. De Gaulle, who has until then been generally reluctant about supporting the resistance, agrees and sends Moulin back to France to unify the French resistance groups. He is parachuted into France in February 1942. Over the following months, he meets with French resistance leaders like Henri Freinet of Combat and Emmanuel Dastier of Libération Sud. In France's polarized political climate, these groups often disagree on ideology or politics or aren't particularly fond of de Gaulle. Moulin manages to unify them nonetheless. In 1943, his efforts lead to the establishment of the United Resistance Movement and its weaponized wing, the Secret Army. Moulin won't get to see the fruits of his work, though, as he will be captured by the Gestapo that summer. He dies in German captivity in Metz on July 8th. And then there are covert operations that are not being directed from London. Belgium and the Netherlands mostly lack central resistance organizations and mostly rely on loosely connected or independent operations. But such activities exist in all of the occupied territories. One such example is that of the Dutch broker Valeraven van Hal, also known as Wally, or the banker to the resistance. He starts the National Support Fund, NSF, in 1942, which he finances with both loans from wealthy Dutch people and with money from the Dutch National Bank, which the Dutch government in exile allows him to steal by falsifying bank bonds. With this money, an estimated 83 million guilders around 572 million euros today, Wally supports many covert operations. These include major clandestine newspaper, a full network for the falsification and distribution of identity papers, armed resistance, and hiding roughly 8,000 Jewish people. He will also go on to initiate De Kern, or The Core, a weekly meeting between resistance leaders cementing his role as a central figure in the Dutch resistance. He too won't live to see the end of the war. One of his men accidentally reveals the location of a meeting he will be attending, where he is arrested on January 27, 1945. Though the Germans don't know they have captured this highly influential figure, his identity is given up by a fellow resistance member under torture, and Wally is executed on February 12th. But not all resistance is large-scale, of course, and this episode barely scratches the surface of movements and leaders. There are many, many more stories that we'd like to tell, and there is also the resistance in Asia, and that will have to wait for future episodes. 
But that is the point of this gallery series, which is more general looks at a gallery of similar subjects. The resistance will be covered in a variety of ways, as it already is in the weekly episodes, in the War Against Humanity series, and on our Instagram day-by-day -day coverage of the war. Resistance comes in many forms. It doesn't necessarily have to be directed by a grand leader to have an effect. The organization of and participation in labor strikes, providing food and clothes to Jews in Poland or to Allied spies behind the lines is important. Using the radio or publishing and distributing clandestine publications are acts of defiance, as is the simple act of not complying with German requests for information. Despite all that, resistance wasn't as common as is popularly believed. Participation in resistance was between 1 and 3 percent in Western Europe and 10 to 15 percent in Poland, though there the German occupation had a much more significant impact on daily life and their brutality was far more visible. From 1942 onwards, though, resistance movements everywhere will increasingly become aggressive and violent. We will see more movie-like operations, like derailing trains, liquidating collaborators and occupiers, raiding offices for food stamps and spying for the Allied forces. And many thousands of ordinary civilians, just the average man or woman on the street in peacetime, will risk their own lives hiding those wanted and persecuted by the occupying regimes. Many people who engage in acts of resistance do so because they witness the atrocities and brutalities committed by occupying forces. I cover a lot of those in our War Against Humanity series. You can click here any moment now to see that playlist. It is to serve the cause of that remembrance that we are here. And that is only made possible by the Time Ghost Army. So join the resistance against forgetting our past and repeating the mistakes of our ancestors by signing up at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell. Never forget. Mm -hmm.